Let's continue our discussion of the lungs. Here we see a right and a left lung with the trachea bifurcating into a the right and left primary bronchi, superior, middle, and inferior lobes on the right, superior lobe and inferior lobe on the left. This right here is known as the oblique fissure, separating the superior and inferior lobes on both of these lungs. So oblique fissure here on the right lung. This is the horizontal fissure. I realize it doesn't look very horizontal in this image, but it's certainly more horizontal than the oblique fissures. Two fissures on the right because there are three lobes, one fissure on the left because there is only one lobe. The bronchi, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves enter and leave the lungs via an indentation that we can't see in this image, but the indentation is known as the hilum. Right around here is the cardiac notch providing room for the heart specifically the apex of the heart which points towards that direction the superior aspect of the lungs are known as the apex of the lungs and the inferior aspect that sits directly on the diaphragm is known as the base of the lungs which is counter to the heart so remember that the inferior most aspect of the heart which would reside around here is the apex and the top where the great vessels come off the heart is known as the base of the heart. I want to take a moment just to review the principles of volume and pressure. An increase in volume is going to result in a decrease in pressure of that container. A decrease in volume is going to result in an increase in pressure. So this decrease in volume of this water balloon resulted in an increase in pressure, so much so that when the pressure inside the water balloon became greater than the pressure outside the water balloon, water was ejected from the water balloon. And those same principles are going to apply to the respiratory system, specifically to inhalation and exhalation. This is not my image. I've stolen it off the World Wide Web. And I realize it's somewhat blurry, but it's nonetheless still a good image. So I want to start with the one on the right. So this blue structure right here is representing the diaphragm. And over on the left, this is the diaphragm as well. I don't know why it's in different colors. But on the right, the diaphragm is relaxed. And when the diaphragm is relaxed, it has a dome shape. Superior to the diaphragm is the thoracic cavity. Inferior to the diaphragm is the abdominal cavity. And that's the case on both of these images. But the one on the right, when the diaphragm is relaxed, and in this dome configuration, the volume of the thoracic cavity has decreased. And accordingly, so will the volume of the lungs. As the volume of the lungs decreases in size, pressure increases. And once that pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure, then air will depart the lungs. The opposite of that allows for inhalation. So when the diaphragm contracts, it shortens and depresses. It moves inferiorly. And in doing so, increases the volume of the thoracic cavity, which accordingly, which will, as a result, increase the volume of the lungs. An increased volume of the lungs will decrease the pressure. Once that pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure, air rushes into the lungs that we see right here. The diaphragm is the major muscle of respiration. During inhalation, the diaphragm is contracting and depressing. This is a result of innervation by the phrenic nerve. There are central pattern generators within the brain that actually set the rhythm of respirations, which can be modified by higher brain centers by increasing the rate of respiration or decreasing the rate of respiration. The diaphragm is the main muscle of respiration along with muscles known as the external intercostal muscles that we'll look at in a second. But just to be clear, when the diaphragm is relaxed, it decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity, expelling air during exhalation. Inhalation is a result of contraction of the diaphragm. The diaphragm moves inferiorly, increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity, and air moves in during inhalation. 
looking at this image right here, we can see how the lungs sit directly on top of the diaphragm and are directly connected to the diaphragm by the serous membranes. So when that diaphragm moves inferiorly, it's going to pull the lungs with them. And there are other muscles involved within inhalation and exhalation. Inhalation is a result of contraction of the diaphragm and of the external intercostal muscles. And when I say inhalation, I'm specifically talking about normal, quiet, everyday inhalation. I'm not referring to a deep, active inhalation. Though so the intercostal muscles reside between the ribs, costal is referring to the ribs. These right here are the internal intercostals, which actually play a part in forced exhalation. But when we're talking about a normal, quiet inhalation, that's the role of these external intercostal muscles that we see right here. Over to the right, we can see a close-up image of this. These, these would be the internal intercostals. These are the external intercostals. The fibers of the external intercostals run the same direction as the pectoralis major and the external abdominal obliques. But during inhalation, due to stimulation by the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm, the diaphragm contracts it moves inferiorly, pulling the lungs down with it. The external intercostals are elevating the ribs, so pulling the ribs superiorly and, as a result, pulling the lungs superiorly. So the lungs are getting pulled from inferior and superior, increasing the volume of the lungs, decreasing the pressure, allowing air to come in during inhalation. So I've mentioned deep inhalation, which is a more aggressive form of inhalation. And that brings on more muscles. Here we see the sternocleidomastoid, which helps elevate the rib cage, as does the pectoralis minor, not seen here, and the scalene muscles that we can see right here. The scalenes run deep to the sternocleidomastoid. So the sternocleidomastoid, the scalene muscles that we see in green here, and the pectoralis minor elevate the rib cage during deep inhalation. Another muscle that aids in deep inhalation is the quadratus lumborum that we see right here and right here. We are looking at an anterior view of the deep muscles of the abdominal region and of the back. This is the psoas major, but lateral to the psoas major is the quadratus lumborum, which pulls the rib cage inferiorly, while the sternocleidomastoid, the scalenes, and the pectoralis minor are elevating the rib cage, So the thoracic cavity is being pulled in both directions in addition to the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. That all helps with deep, aggressive inhalation. Now, to be clear, exhalation is generally a passive process. No muscles are really needed for exhalation. The elastic fibers of the lungs allow the lungs to recoil back to their original shape. Certainly during a forced exhalation, ab abdominal muscles can be activated as can the internal intercostal muscles and the latissimus dorsi of the back. So during forced exhalation, more muscles are being brought on to expel air. But generally speaking, exhalation is a passive process that doesn't require muscle activity. Now, one thing I also wanna talk about are respirations. And I suggested that respirations have a rhythmic pattern that is generated by the ventral respiratory group of the medulla oblongata. And we talked about the phrenic nerve activating the diaphragm. But there are higher brain centers that can modify the rate of respirations, specifically increase the rate of respirations if it is needed, and this is dictated by chemoreceptors that are detecting changes in carbon dioxide, oxygen, and pH. And we talked about this when we were talking about the cardiovascular system, but there are peripheral chemoreceptors within the aorta and within the carotid artery known as the carotid and aortic bodies. And these are detecting changes in levels of oxygen, CO2, and pH. Specifically, depressed levels of oxygen will increase the rate of respiration. Increased levels of carbon dioxide will increase the rate of respiration. Those really mean the same thing. Decreased oxygen is going to result in an increase in CO2. 
an increase of CO2 is also going to correlate to a decrease in pH. So these peripheral chemoreceptors of the carotid and aortic bodies are going to send signals to the brain to increase the rate of respirations during elevated CO2, decreased pH, and decrease partial pressure of oxygen. There are also central chemoreceptors within the medulla oblongata that detect the same chemicals, that is to say oxygen, CO2, and pH. So now we have talked about the relationship between volume and pressure. We've talked about the muscles that activate the rib cage to adjust the volume of the rib cage and accordingly the lungs which are bound or adhering to the rib cage. And we're going to talk about the serous membranes which allow the lungs to move when the thoracic cavity moves, when the rib cage moves, when the diaphragm moves. But I just want to reiterate the significance of surface tension. We talked about the alveoli, how we absolutely do not want surface tension in the alveoli, which is the result of the binding of water molecules to each other via a process known as hydrogen bonding. I'm not worried about hydrogen bonding for an anatomy class like this, but just keep in mind, hydrogen bonding causes water molecules to stick together, to be bound together, as we see with the drip, the dripping of the faucet here. Here we see some of the water just sticking right up to the bottom aspect of the faucet because they are adhering to each other. And certainly they maintain the droplet form because of hydrogen bonding. And this is significantly important in adjusting the volume of the lungs during inhalation and exhalation. So when the rib cage, when the diaphragm, when the clavicles, they're all ex being moved outwards to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity, that means nothing unless the lungs are going to move with all of these skeletal components and certainly the muscle, which is the diaphragm. So the lungs need to adhere to these skeletal components, such as the ribs, which we see right here. So in pink, we see the right and left lung. Lining the lungs are the serous membranes. So directly adhering to the lung, and I'm just looking at the right side here, is the visceral pleura. This is the serous membrane, the innermost lining of the serous membranes. It's adhering directly to the lung. That's this green line right here that circumvents this whole lung both lungs. The outermost green line right here is the parietal pleura. They certainly are the same membrane because it just folds back on itself, but the outer one we refer to as the parietal pleura, the inner one we refer to as the visceral pleura. In between the parietal pleura and visceral pleura in this yellow space right here is the pleural cavity which is filled with pleural fluid, which is mainly water. So all of this yellow is the pleural cavity filled with pleural fluid. Now, to be clear, that pleural cavity is not gonna be as large and as wide as I have it drawn in this image, but I'm just trying to show you that there are two distinct layers, the visceral layer and the parietal layer, which tend to be stuck together due to surface tension. Because the parietal pleura is lined with fluid or water and the visceral pleura is lined with fluid or water, those two membranes stick to each other. And we had talked about if you dip two slides, microscope slides or panes of glass in water and put those panes of glass next to each other, you can easily slide those panes of glasses or microscope slides against each other but it's very, very, very challenging to pull those apart. And that's because of surface tension. And that surface tension due to the interaction of water molecules allows the parietal pleura to be attached to the visceral pleura. Now, why do we care that the parietal pleura is attached to the visceral pleura? Because when this rib cage, and these are all representing ribs, red in between these, are going to be the intercostal muscles. 
when these ribs move outward, the lungs are going to move outward with them because this parietal pleura is attached to the innermost aspect of these ribs. Same thing with the diaphragm. When the diaphragm moves inferiorly, the parietal pleura is going to move with the diaphragm. And because the parietal pleura is stuck to the visceral pleura due to the surface tension, it's going to move the lungs inferiorly. The external intercostals are going to move the lungs out to the side and to a certain degree superiorly, as will during forced inhalation, the scalene muscles, sternocleidomastoid, and pectoralis major. So the point here is that the visceral pleura and parietal pleura stick together due to surface tension. And when the thoracic cavity moves, the lungs move with it. Once again, during exhalation, it is generally a passive process. We don't need contraction of any muscles for the lungs to recoil because they have elastic fibers that allow the lungs to decrease back to their original size. That is volume and pressure of the thoracic cavity, the lungs, and the respiratory system.